So we might begin. I want to invite any uh, comments or reflections that might have arisen as a result of this morning's meditation or any associated sort of thoughts that are uh, stirring. So the idea today is to, um, rather than having a sort of set question and answer kind of format at the end of me doing something, I'd rather we kind of wove, interwove the two more organically. So I think on a, with a group this size, that's quite uh, a good thing to be able to do. It works well. So has anyone got any thoughts or...? Self-compassion, yeah. Can everyone hear okay, by the way? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this idea that when you were talking about like self-cherishing as opposite to cherishing others, I mm. think maybe the idea is we include all sentient beings, including ourselves, into cherishing. Yeah. We appreciate our as part of, uh-huh. of, of this human community. So that's your solution to that possible dilemma? That's what, I, that's what actually I thought. So yeah. I think, you know, first I was cherishing others and forget about myself. Mm-hmm. think about you know, self-compassion and when we were doing the meditation, the idea that maybe we should just you know, be, uh, include ourselves yeah. in cherishing others. Or vice versa, if we you know, take care of ourselves, we will learn to include others yeah. in the same yeah. cherishing. So you've raised two sort of uh, ideas together, but exactly... Not, not the opposite, like if I yeah. turn myself and I don't share it out, it's vice versa. Mm. It's like I'm part of this interconnected yeah. community yeah. and I think, I think you know, you've, you've really encapsulated the whole topic and also the whole challenge of the topic mm-hmm. in your sort of uh, comments. And I've already... Uh, written up there, um, self-cherishing is not legitimate concern for self. And I, I thought as I was writing that the word legitimate is a bit tricky because it sounds legal, legalistic, but I just meant valid. It's sound, it's, it's, it's justifiable on ordinary terms. It's perfectly legitimate to care for oneself. So this is getting back to your point. Sorry, I, I can't see your name. Tanya's point, but it involves teasing out the distinction between concern for self, if you like, and cherish self-cherishing. And this is why I was so careful at the beginning to say we need to realise what we're doing with our terminology. So when we're using the word self-cherishing here, we're meaning something very specific. So does anyone have any thoughts about what it does mean, self-cherishing? as opposed to concern for the self. Egotistical? Egotistical? Pardon? Self-absorbed? Narcissistic? Because cherishing is like holding the mirror. It's kind of like holding the mirror, holding the mirror. Holding? More dear. More dear. So... Yep. Mm. Self-cherishing might have the innuendo that it's holding more dear. 
Yes, I think it's very, very valuable. Thank you. Just an element? <laughs> like a flavour, a spice of... A <laughs> Yeah, we take it in. Um, Jane, do you want to help sort of guide? Yes, you do so well. I was. Is that certainly the aim of the meditation? But I think uh, there's a sense in which traipsing through that openness is a little device called self-cherishing that keeps reprioritizing and reading things back for me. So we're, we're working with that little, little traveller in that bigger space, if you like. Self-cherishing is the word cherishing is interesting. I mean, it has various connotations, but it's predicated in the Buddhist presentation on what we call self-grasping. So through having an over-inflated idea of who we are as a self, as a person, we build all of these needs and qualities on top of that compulsively that demand that we read the world back as something that is meant to be serving me. And if it's not, it's going to be punished or pushed, etc., etc. And so Helen mentioned narcissism. You know, that's really a good way of looking at it. It's, it's kind of cosmological narcissism, self-cherishing, because it's reading everything that arises in terms of me. So it's the same mentality that says there are five chocolates and there's six people in the room and I'm not situated very well in my chair. <laughs> so I then watch tentatively as the chocolates get handed around, predicting the flow in terms of the seating arrangements, and then realise with an appalling recognition that I'm going to miss out. And at that moment I experience mental turmoil and distress. And that alters my perspective of the others enjoying their chocolates. Not, I don't consciously bemoan the fact that they're enjoying their chocolate, because that would be just too miserable to consider. But at some level, I'm disappointed that they're the ones enjoying the chocolate because it was meant to be me. And so that kind of meant to be me-ness is compulsive. It's operating according to the Buddhist psychological presentation through the force of delusions, these ways of apprehending phenomena which are distorted. 
and exaggerated. And so from a Western psychological point of view, we'll talk about projection here. We project our ego outwards and attempt to squeeze everything into it in terms of reading it back. And it doesn't work. There's always an antagonism, a struggle there. So the word cherishing can be used in multiple ways, but self-cherishing in this context is, is predicated on self-grasping and it's painful. Self-cherishing is painful. Yeah. So how would you describe the exaggeration? Um, this I that exists in a way that is independent of uh, causes and conditions, stands alone, and is more important than others. And I really like what His Holiness says. He says there's seven billion people on this planet. How is it possible that this one is the most important? Mm. Everyone deserves, I deserve to be happy. 
So I think that very often the people that are stressed, they are stressed because they think that they don't deserve to be happy. That's why the whole like, middle way between do not forget about yourself if you want to take care of others. Because I can see how it can go very wrong if people think that they don't deserve to be happy. And they become stressed, they think selfish because they want to show that they want the world to tell them that they deserve to be happy because they're beautiful, because I have this, because I go there. I deserve to be happy. So I think his Holiness calls that um, feeling that I deserve to be happy our birthright. It's our fundamental right to not only to wish to be happy, but to, to, to work for our happiness. So that's different from selfishness in the sense that we're talking about here, which is predicated on reconstruing others in a way that enables us to regulate their distance from us according to friend, enemy and stranger. And we're constantly juggling those, those categories. So we don't have universal compassion, universal love. We have biased compassion. We have partial love, etc., etc. And so Buddhism is very ambitious here because it's trying to break down that partisan structure. And that involves beginning to break down clinging to a self-view of who we are, which is predicated on that bias, those systems of bias. And in order to do that, we need to go deeper to look at this fundamental ability we have to transform in positive ways that are so radical, they're unimaginable, be wonderful. But it's difficult to get there without working with the nitty gritty of our current behavioral dilemmas and habits and, and problems. And so we, we end up having this big view, but we have to deal with the nitty gritty of our individual momentary struggle in life and our relationships. And so this teaching of Lojong, thought transformation, is all about practicing through our social engagements. It's saying that you can't just sit on your cushion and develop an ideal attitude. That came up the very first quote, remember? If you have sit on your mountaintop and meditate for your whole life with a selfish attitude, you'll gain absolutely nothing from that meditation. It has no, no outcome, a beneficial outcome. And so if we meditate on love and compassion, develop universal love and compassion, and then someone says, why didn't you make my tea? And we snap at them, we've kind of lost the plot in, in, a, in a very, very uh, profound way. We haven't understood the import. And so for me, this idea of, of putting self-cherishing aside is to begin to see clearly what's there, both in terms of my, me and others. We begin to see them both realistically and their relationships with each other realistically. And so Buddhism here invites this idea of interdependency. And this is going to come up in, in the topics that our, my happiness is dependent on others. It can't be achieved in spite of others. This, this is so important to consider. Yep.
Tara that she cannot help unless we ask. You know, that's, that's, I think ultimately, you know, that's wrong. Asking for help, I want to help. Mm -hmm. And I can walk around with all these cherishing others and say, I want to help you, but unless that person next to me is ready and, and let me, lets me take care of them, it's actually, you know, to help others is a privilege. Yes. And, and when people say, I can do this one, if, you know, like, oh, I don't need anyone, I, I don't need you, you I don't need my, I, I can do it, I, you know. I, I, at the end of the day, it's the ego telling you, you know, I'm so great that you just can't. You know, so um, when, we'll, when other people let us take care of them and let us mm -hmm. cherish them, it's actually a privilege. Mm -hmm. So these are the thoughts that are going to keep moving around throughout the course of the day. I thought, um, to quote uh, the Dalai Lama, he says, um, the fundamental point is that if you do not have the capacity to love yourself, then there is simply no basis upon which to build a sense of caring towards others. Love for yourself does not mean that you are, are indebted to yourself. Rather, the capacity to love oneself or to be kind to oneself should be based on a very fundamental fact of human existence that we all have the capaci natural capacity to desire happiness and to avoid suffering. Therefore, when we find statements in the teachings such as disregard your own well-being and, cherishing, and cherish the well-being of others, which gets back to Tanya's point, we should understand them in the context of training yourself according to the ideal of compassion. This is important if we are not to indulge in self-centred ways of thinking that disregard the impact of our actions on other sentient beings. As I said earlier, we can develop an attitude of considering other sentient beings as precious in the recognition of the part of their kind of, of the part their kindness plays in our own experience of joy, happiness and success. This is the first consideration. So I think for me this is a very, very valuable uh, point because it's suggesting that we, in a sense, de- egotize the whole issue, de-psychologize the whole issue. There's this incredible urgency in the West to understand me, which we're getting to the point before with the media and so forth, selfies and so forth, to actualize me, 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 me in this sort of highly individualized, fully accomplished way. Um, that's a sort of form of vanity in the end because it's never achieved successfully. We have to take another selfie because yesterday's selfie is stale. People have forgotten that I'm special and I had the best holiday. I have to re-establish a better holiday, a better waterfall, and so forth. And so there's a kind of urgency there to keep re restating. And here we're saying that the very fact that I wish to be happy and not to suffer is the foundation of my right to care for myself, just as it is to care for others equally. So that becomes the common denominator. And already it reproportions the degree of exaggeration connected to self-cherishing and begins to open up the prospect of beginning to value others more. Because this is the essential point here, that in that meditation we did in the morning, if I only look after one person, i.e. myself, then I'm only looking after one person. If I can use this one person to care for others, many can benefit. And because we're all equal in wishing to be happy and not to suffer, that greater benefit is more precious than just the benefit to this one, i.e. myself, which is getting back to your quote from the Dalai Lama about, I'm just one of a billion, why should I be more special than all the others? The, the point of this exercise is that we're all as special as I am. And if we really believe that in our heart, the 
egotistical structures can't grip in the same way. So um, His Holiness talks about wisely, being wisely selfish. He says, some of you may have actually heard the remark that I make quite often, that in the sense of bodhisattvas, those intent on becoming enlightened for the others, the compassionate practitioners of the Buddhist path are wisely selfish people, whereas people like ourselves are the foolishly selfish. We think of ourselves and disregard others, and the result of, of that is that we're always unhappy and have a miserable time. The time has come to think more wisely, hasn't it? This is my belief. So this is the challenge, to think more wisely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very valuable, isn't it, to think that way. So we should be eating well. We should be exercising. We should be having looking after our, our needs and those of the, around us, etc., etc. To do that is to be self-abusive, to be injuring this one. What would injure this one? We get back to the issue of, of despair. You know, it's actually and the idea that some people can't find happiness. We're all capable of thinking that way if our despair becomes very, very powerful and very strong. And so. Buddhism here is always provocative, but it, it, it suggests that self-denigration, this is really outrageous, is a form of laziness. It's one of the three forms of laziness. Because if we denigrate ourselves convincingly, i.e. I'm nothing, I'm worthless, I'm a blight on the world and should be dead, we're actually precluding totally our capacity to be responsible for ourselves and to care for ourselves. We're forfeiting that responsibility in relation to this one. How then are we to imagine doing anything in the world for others if we can't do something for this one? So that isn't selfish. That's our primary point of responsibility. That's why when we do the meditation, we sit on this spot. We're taking hold of our fundamental responsibility. And this, from a Buddhist perspective, is ethical. It's the true meaning of, of ethics. The very choice not to harm another person is an ethical decision. The fact that we can sit here calmly together and enjoy today is because there's a decision that we're not going to harm each other. It sounds ridiculous to say that, but it's actually true. And there are countries in this world at the moment where people can't sit comfortably knowing that they're not going to be harmed. You know, there are mothers with children in Syria hiding under kitchen tables for fear of being bombed. There's no safety there. And so Buddhism's all the time tracing back the source of, of that harmful intent which is writ large in the case of war, uh, is also to be found writ, la writ large in our own little microcosmic operations as well, when we give rise to a powerful delusion that disregards the happiness of others. So the first... Um, we've all got a handout here, and... We might do this meditation after lunch um, rather than now, but it's a classic um, meditation which involves visualising uh, Amitabha Buddha. And we might think, why do we do a meditation like this? And the great uh, beauty of this meditation is that when we establish the visualisation of Amitabha Buddha above our crown, we then imagine certain nectars and energy flowing into us, which then enables us to move out towards concern for others on that basis. And so it gives us another framework 
for working with our actual situation and our actual condition. And so what's really extraordinary about these sorts of meditations involving visualization is that we're having to visualize the Buddha in perfect form, having perfect qualities. And you might think, well, I don't believe in Buddhas, you know, what, this is just fantasy. But if we even look at that situation, we realize that we're creating that best example, best practice of what we're capable of in the form of a visualization of the Buddha. And so when I absorb energy down, say, may I not be jealous and, and not seek revenge and imagine that that energy is flowing into us from the visualization, we're actually working with ourselves in a very, very profound way. And so visualization meditation has a, a, another way of working with these situations, which is uh, to do with the energies, if you like, involved in our, our situations. So we will explore that, but we'll notice here that on page two, uh, we have the actual eight verses. And so I might just we'll read them together, but I'll, I'll um, start with the first. With a determination to achieve the highest aim for the benefit of all sentient beings, which surpasses even the wish-fulfilling gem, may I hold them dear at all times. Whenever I interact with someone, may I view myself as the lowest amongst all and from the very depths of my heart respectively hold others as superior. In all my deeds, may I probe into my mind and as soon as, a mental and emotion, as, as mental and emotional afflictions arise, as they endanger myself and others, may I strongly confront them and avert them. When I see others of unpleasant character oppressed by strong negativity and suffering, may I hold them dear, for they are rare to find, as if I had discovered a jewel treasure. When others, out of jealousy, treat me wrongly with abuse, slander and scorn, may I take upon myself the defeat and offer to others the victory. When someone whom I have helped or in whom I have placed great hopes mistreats me in extremely hurtful ways, may I regard him still as my precious teacher. In brief, may I offer benefit and joy to all my mothers, both directly and indirectly, may I quietly take upon myself all the hurts and pains of my mothers. May all this remain undefiled by the stain, stains of the eight mundane concerns, and may I recognize all things as illusion, devoid of clinging, be released from bondage. So they're the, the eight verses, and so that's our, our sort of fundamental structure for the today. So returning to the verse one, with a determination to achieve the highest aim for the benefit of all sentient beings, which surpasses even the wish-fulfilling gem, may I hold them dear at all times. His Holy the Dalai Lama says that these four lines about cultivating a sense of holding dear all other sentient beings emphasizes what it is to develop an attitude that enables us to regard other sentient beings as precious, much in the manner of precious jewels. The question could be raised, why do we need to cultivate the thought that other sentient beings are precious and valuable? So has anyone got any clues as to why we would need to generate that thought?
So I think that that's certainly the case, but that's from your perspective. Why should we regard other beings as jewel-like from their perspective? What's jewel-like in the others? Yeah, I think that's, again, it's true. But is there something there that's as precious as a jewel in the other? Irrespective of me looking at them. Yep. It's almost like mind training. I remember I was here and Michael was here and Trump had just been elected and we were horrified. And I think Michael said, well, I'm using as a precious jewel. Shirakutra was the foremost um, student of the Buddha. And Shirakutra was a Brahma. Um, the Buddha came from the warrior class. Anyway, the Brahmins sort of believed that they, they knew everything. So Shirakutra's mother was critical of her son because he, she thought that he joined these, you know, Nehru girls or something. And um, she, she sort of denigrated him because he wasn't a Brahma. And when Sharapitra brought um, some other Buddhist students with him once to visit his mother, his mother was so rude and she said, um, she said to the other students, so you are the man who made my son your page boy. You know, because Sharapitra was so humble. So I think love is a very, I think, a very useful term to keep in mind. Yeah. I was just going to say, there is something precious inside them. Yeah. Because we're all the same, we have a good nature. Ah. Yeah. Everyone is, yeah. has that. Yeah. Yes, I think I like that answer. <laughs> we all hold Buddha nature as an in, innermost natural birthright potential. There's an extraordinary notion in Buddhism about virtue. We, we tend, I think, a lot in sort of so-called Western terms to think of uh, good and evil in sort of Manichaean uh, Christianic terms as some sort of cosmological application of divine force that can either be positive or negative, and that's exerted onto humanity. Buddhism takes the exact opposite approach it says that something is either virtuous or non-virtuous by dint of its impact and outcome on ourself or another person. And so if our actions lead to the happiness of the other or the self, it's virtuous. And if it leads to harm and restriction, it is non-virtuous. So you can see here how it's contingent. There's no external moral universe that's shaping things. Well, ethics is to do with the actual mode of our practice. This is really, really vital because it takes responsibility back to the lived moment in every moment. And so there's a wonderful term in Buddhism called field of virtue. And the idea is that if we create virtuous actions of body, speech and mind as a person, we create a field of virtue in which others 
qualities can positively ripen like flowers germinating from a seed in rich, fallowed, nourished ground. This is an incredible idea. If we attack and repeatedly assault a child as they're growing up, that child's ability as a person to gain fulfilment and a purpose in life is curtailed, if not traumatically damaged. So, getting back to Helen's point, love has the opposite aspect, because it's, it's a virtue. It produces the potential conditions for the positive ripening of the other person without threat or danger. That's what our virtue enables at an individual level. Of course it's only contributing, but it's looking at it as a form of interdependency that's very, very, very uh, rich in its, in its meaning. Did you have a comment? Or? Oh, no, sorry. oh, yeah. <laughs> so field of virtue. If we create a field of virtue, others can flourish. And their jewel-like Buddha natures can manifest more easily. And so a wish-fulfilling gem in Buddhism is a mythological sort of idea, but it, it's, the idea is that you, you do find a, a special jewel called a wish-fulfilling jewel, and if that's placed at the top of a, a victory banner on a mountain and then blessed, it's said that all of one's wishes can be fulfilled. So when I was travelling in Ladakh, I saw a number of, of wish-fulfilling gems on the tops of banners, on the tops of mountains, blowing away in the wind. They're, the Ladakhis put them everywhere, hoping that everyone's wishes are going to be fulfilled. It's, it's a lovely act of, of generosity, isn't it? To sort of uh, build, if only we built wish-fulfilling jewels in our city squares. Just to have that idea of a wish-fulfilling jewel is already a radical emblem of the potential of, of helping each other. Yeah. Anyway, so it's a wish fulfilling jewel for you as well, which is getting back to your, to your point. Yeah. So that's a side product. It's not the principal aim, if you like. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Because our selfish self thinks that I'll only be happy if I scramble for it at all costs. Whereas cherishing others more than self, as presented, in this verse in particular, is saying that it will only be fulfilled, our own purpose will only be fulfilled by cherishing others more than ourselves. So it's the exact opposite of the egotistical logic. And so the e e egotistical logic spins endless webs of confusion and trouble. So we're trying to slice through that whole operation so this idea of developing a universal, unbiased love and compassion has the ability to soften in radical ways our self-cherishing so that we begin to see others for the first time. In, in the, the Methods for Generating Bodhicitta, we, we're meant to do, generate a, a love that has the aspect of pleasantness. And this idea of pleasantness means that if we have genuine love and we see another person, that person appears to us as attractive. This is really interesting. We're not saying, oh, they've got great hair, <laughs> love their genes. They, there is something there which is endearing. We feel fondly towards them without even knowing who they are. This is getting back to His Holiness Dalai Lama's example of, of caring for, with compassion for a wounded animal. We don't need to know the animal to feel compassion. 
the very fact that the animal is there and it is suffering is already a foundation for pure, compassionate concern. So the, these are really interesting ideas. Yeah. Don't believe in cows. Mm. But it's anyway. We th these are interesting examples. I, I'm just as interested in, in the in the posturing mechanisms that are going circulating around the issue of the hapless cow. It's really not about the cow at all, is it? It's about people big noting their own superior perspective based on their demolition of the value of a cow, mm -hmm. hoping they're going to get Guernseys or, or points. Well, I can say, how do people come to believe in their Crikey, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> you just throw that in there. <laughs> I'd like to think that's a topic that will um, be answered by the end of the day. <laughs> Buddhism says that the delusions on the mind, which are like clouds obscuring the fundamental Buddha nature, exist in the form of being adventitious. Adventitious means they're temporary and unstable by nature. They only exist for as long as the causes for their production are active. And so an example is that I can be filled with anger in the morning, totally filled with anger, but that anger can be forgotten the same afternoon. So the fact that the mind can be separated from anger, even though sometimes it can be accompanied by it, is a sign that anger itself is not the fundamental nature of the mind. This is really, really important. So it's called an adventitious defilement. It's a stain, a blockage, an obscuration that prevents us, in this case, from acting in a way that would cherish the others. I'm, I'm always appalled at my own anger's capacity to misread the situation. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience <laughs> with anger. Anger can get things totally wrong. I, I went through a period of time where I was collecting um, uh, ceramics in, in the 50s ceramics and I had a, had a partner who uh, I broke up from and I went to stay with him in Sydney a couple of years later and I just, when he was out at work 
I had a look around the house, and I discovered on a wardrobe one of the best examples of one of the ceramics I'd been looking for. And I was furious that he had bought it for himself, based on his knowledge of ceramics that he'd learnt from me. <laughs> I know, it's shock this is shocking behaviour. <laughs> and it wasn't until several days later that I confronted him with this appalling act of treason. And guess what he said? I bought it for your birthday. <laughs> How dreadful is that? That epitomises, doesn't it, the degree of distortion. Oh, it, it is absolutely shocking. That self-cherishing. I've had the experience, and I'm talking about myself here, of getting frustrated in a long queue. Anyone had this experience? <laughs> because someone is moving really, really slowly in front of me. And then, you know, I'm, I just, I'm not actually pushing them away, but I'm kind of feeling pushing away energy coming. And I'm getting edgy. And I'm sort of intruding on their body space, but not too much so because it would be impolite, but it's kind of becoming obvious that I can't bear it. And then suddenly they turn around and you discover that they're holding a walking frame and they're barely able to stand. What happens to my self-cherishing at that moment? It just collapses in shame. I'm shamed by my misreading of the situation. So one would have to say that self-cherishing is doing this all the time in all directions, always, to greater or lesser extents. And so it's getting back to this idea that love has the aspect of, of pleasantness or fondness, that we don't need to know the quality of the other to feel love towards them. So it's not predicated on the systems of self-cherishing. So the Dalai Lama says the point in relation to this verse, is to try to develop the scope of one's empathy in such a way that it can extend to any form of life, including cows, that has a capacity to feel pain and experience happiness. It is a matter of defining a living organism as a sentient being. This kind of sentiment is very powerful and there is no need to be able to identify in specific terms with every single living being in order for it to become effective. And so in this Bodhi... Yes. There's no need to identify in specific terms with every single living being in order for it to become effective. A lot to think about there. But what it means is if we develop this universal regard for the welfare of others, then when an individual situation arises, they'll appear pleasantly and we'll know how to respond appropriately. Even though we haven't met them or can't remember having met them before, we don't know anything about them but we've created the conditions for them to appear attractively from spontaneously. And so we don't have to put all the neurotic ego structures in play that are going to judge that person in relation to me. And so this, I mentioned this morning, a stra the stranger category is a really interesting one here because we dynamically estrange the stranger. They're not naturally a stranger. We unnaturally deform them into strangers. And as a result, we can't recognise who's there. That's, that's actually the, the reason self-cherishing is doing it. It's work. Because it can't afford, it can't afford to recognise the need of who is there. If Trump recognised the needs of Kurdish mothers to protect their children, he could not have done what he's recently done with that decision 
to withdraw troops from the border there. He's thinking partially. It's not unbiased concern. So there's a, a very um, beautiful expression um, photo here, which is a bit hard to see, but it's a, you can probably get, get a, a glimpse of it. It's a small boy who ran onto a road to rescue a dog. And he ran between lanes of fast-moving traffic to get there. And so the example there is, is that boy's compassion for that dog was spontaneous and urgent. It was unmediated by any regard for himself. So from a Buddhist perspective, you're going to say, well, that's an interesting example, but the boy's putting his own life at risk. Hopefully, as a wise, compassionate person, we would make the same decision to rescue the dog, but would also judge getting across the road without getting killed or rescuing, um, risking anyone else's life in order to get to the dog. So we need to combine compassion and wisdom, in other words. This is the great challenge. So Shanti Deva, the great uh, Indian saint, says, this intention to benefit all beings, which does not arise in others, even for their own, is an extraordinary jewel of the mind, and its birth is an unprecedented wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if as situations arise and you're developing various regards for others and some of them are really irritating you and you can think, oh, you precious wish-fulfilling jewel, <laughs> the ability of that hostility or irritation kind of falls down, doesn't it? If it's not just token, of course. Yeah.
people. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, getting back to that earlier point I was making regarding feminism and patriarchy, really. There, there was an article in the New York Times about leaning in. I don't know if anyone read it. Um, talking about wizard, um, women are becoming empowered in the workplace as executives and so forth, and they're being asked or demanded to lean in, meaning to lean into power and responsibility and, and get on with it kind of thing. And the article was saying, well, it mightn't be a, a matter of getting women to lean in, what if it was a matter of getting men to lean out? What if we take the model of a mother's love and apply it to all our relations? What happens to our ethical structures? They're kind of transformed. And so this, I think, a really rich uh, area of, of contemplation there. Because it, it strikes me, as it does with all of us, I'm sure, that in war zones it seems to be who invented all this machinery? You know, wh where's it from? And what's it being used for? There's kind of a complete divorce there. So it's, kind of, it's shocking when we, we start to, to think about it. It's, it's based on an impulse at some point. And so there's a, an Italian futurist philosopher called um, Paul Virilio. I don't know if anyone's read his work. He argues in a very, very interesting way that modern warfare is the most virulent form of warfare ever because it's now conducted remotely. And remotely means that we don't even have to be in physical contact with our target anymore. So we have someone sitting behind a computer screen in Dallas Drone, directing the drone attack on the car as it turns the corner in a village in Afghanistan. They push the button, it's like playing a war game, literally playing a war game. So they're now beginning to deal with post-traumatic shock, apparently, amongst the workers involved in drone attacks. Because they're going home at night and thinking, what if that family was... Or they realise they bombed a family by mistake. And they're kind of, there's some moral implications there. So in other words, the technology is creating the detachment. It's enabling the detachment. So I'm wondering whether the mother's technology of holding is the exact opposite of that detachment, isn't it? It's proximate. It's absolutely proximate. It's, it's tender. It's embracing the care of even the body of the other, so it won't come to harm. Even in the smallest movements. You know, a mother's watching to see whether the kid's going to put its hand into a, a radiator or pull a saucepan handle from the stove, etc., etc. These are all predictions that the mother's making on behalf of someone else. If only our culture was making predictions to protect others rather than making predictions of how much we could harm them by the invention of technologies. So um, let's, let's do a little meditation, because we're meant to be meditating on the verses. <laughs> it was a meditation workshop. So we're going to do a, a, a short uh, meditation on the first verse, which is seeing others as precious and holding them dear. So just uh, spend a few moments establishing our posture on our spot, centering ourselves. Becoming aware of the breath.
So we're now going to contemplate some of the implications of this verse. Thinking how it invites us to view others with a sense of deep gratitude. So just contemplate that we've received incalculable benefit and help from others throughout our lifetime. Even in the womb our mother was protecting us, monitoring her activities and so forth for our benefit. So if we trace our lives through from the earliest moments of this life, at every turn we recognize we've received incalculable benefit from others in every direction, in every way. We can consider our family, partners, friends, Even the person stocking the goods on the supermarket shelf, whose name we don't know. Even the worms nourishing the ground in which our vegetables grow. Houses, hospitals, when we're sick there's someone to care for us. Without the efforts of others, we would be incapable of surviving. So just explore or examine in our own way whether a feeling or wave of gratitude does in fact arise in relation to contemplating how we're benefited in relation to these beings, how our happiness is dependent upon them and what they give us.
You might have gratitude perhaps to a, an immediate relation, for example, because we're quite conscious of what they've given us or do for us. But how far out does this attitude reach? How wide is our recognition of how others benefit us? And now pick an example in the midst of all of this where we might not feel gratitude at all towards someone, but in fact resentment or a wish to dismiss them. Just explore what attitude is involved in this dismissal, rejection. And how does it differ from this sense of gratitude that we've just acknowledged? Can we rework this situation so that we can also include this person with gratitude? The bottom line here is that even our so-called worst enemy measures the degree of our own failure of patience, tolerance and compassion. So perhaps they are the most precious wish-fulfilling jewel So the goal of this meditation is to generate an attitude that holds others dear and wishes to benefit them in return. In return. This is a resolve from our heart. So Shanti Deva says, May I be the doctor and the medicine And may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. And with that we conclude the meditation. It's really good to use these sorts of meditations on the run uh, in the sense that if we are having a particular problem with a particular person at a particular time, then we extract ourselves from that situation and sit down and take that as our meditation. We take that person as our meditation object and see if we can rework it in the actual meditation.
So uh, the last line of the verse is, may I hold them dear at all times. Not just sometimes or when I feel like it. And so the only way such a regard can unfold is if we have subdued and dissolved away self-cherishing. Because then this attitude of regard for others is appearing spontaneously without effort. This is a remarkable idea. There's another problematic idea in the West of... We, it sort of became popular about 10 years ago. Um, it was called compassion fatigue. Do you remember compassion fatigue? It was a bit like repetitive... Uh, uh, so called RSI, it sort of had a little epoch of its own. And people were complaining about fit, compassion fatigue. And this is a really interesting but very strange idea that somehow compassion can get exhausted or impoverished by overuse. It's not to say we shouldn't be able to rest. This again gets back to some really important points about managing the situation. But if it's a genuine compassion, it will arise spontaneously. If it's mixed with self-cherishing, there's more at stake. So I love you for as long as you make me feel lovable. And the moment you don't, you're out. I think it's called divorce, or there's all sorts of tactics for doing it. We evict people from our lives. We extract them, we rub them out, we ignore them, etc, etc, etc. Compassion doesn't need to do any of these things. It has a bare, open communication spontaneously with what's there. So it's able to discern the need of the other in a completely wise manner that's not distorted by egotistical cravings or expectations for that matter. So, um, Geshe Doga says, in his commentary to this verse, when we generate a genuine wish for all beings to obtain happiness and be free from suffering, it is an unbiased thought as it includes every sentient being in existence. In that moment, we are letting go of any judgmental thoughts or discrimination. When we embrace being all beings as equal, divisive thoughts are completely abandoned. The equilibrium developed through generating such a thought is supreme and we can feel we have done something significant. This practice forms the basis for developing higher states of mind. If we acquaint our mind with this thought again and again, even if only for a few moments a day, it will help to further develop our mind. Through gradual acquaintance and consistency, it will become more and more natural. So this word natural is another way of talking about this sponta spontaneity. It's no longer feigned or fabricated. So it's recognised that in order to overhaul self-cherishing, we have to do a fair bit of work, but that it will increasingly become possible to dismantle more and more subtle levels of self-cherishing until it no longer can get itself up and away. So there are many different ways of approaching this, but... Um, that's really the import of this stanza. So, um, are there any thoughts before we move up, move on? Yeah. Just noticing that this uh, version, which is by Tukchen Jinpa, yeah. uh, actually differs from the version in our... That's exactly why I had it printed. Yeah. Whereas in here we have who excel the wish fulfilling gem. Mm. So here it's talking about the state of enlightenment being the wish fulfilling gem. Yeah. Here it's talking about all sentient beings being the wish fulfilling yeah. gem. So do you think in the original both are the wish fulfilling gem? 
Yes, there's two versions of the eight verses in, in the tradition. Yeah, and and they, it covers the, both those aspects. Yeah. Well, it amounts to the same thing if we think about it a bit more. Because each individual has the capacity to become enlightened. Therefore, the wish fulfilling gem is enlightenment. But then each of us has the same potential. Therefore, we all carry the seeds of that, of that jewel. Yeah, you can marry them together. This is um, the version we've got here is, is uh, Tupton Jimpa's translation. Uh, used most recently for His Holiness the Dalai Lama's teaching on the eight verses. So it's, uh, that's why I, it has a certain um, clarity to it, I think. So um, we've got ten minutes. We might just forecast uh, the second verse. Whenever I interact with someone... May I view myself as the lowest amongst all and from the very depths of my heart respectively hold others as superior. So you'll notice a difference here too, Ingrid, won't you? Because the other thing said as supreme. Yeah. This one says as superior. So it's, yes, there's a difference in meaning there. So how do we go with that one? That's, I think, throwing the cat amongst the pigeons. Because especially if we're coming from an abusive background or being abused background and here this guy sitting out the front here saying, oh, by the way, you have to hold yourself the lowest of all, is that really carte blanche to be further abused without any right of reply or any maintenance of personal dignity? What on earth is this outrageous verse getting at? Am I to kind of worship self-humiliation and tawdry denigration and misery in the name of caring for others? These, these are really powerful questions. And I'm sort of thinking that if you're looking at that, you have to use your wisdom. Mm -hmm. Use what exactly? Your one's own capacity to do things. You mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I suppose if you're how you're actually viewing people. Uh huh. I mean, Need, need to really tackle what it is that we do think here. Like, I think there's a danger in so becoming sort of Buddhistic. I'm just giving that example. Is that we, we learn all this, the theory and the answers and we, we do it. I'm doing Buddhism. I'm doing, I'm doing love. I'm doing compassion. I'm doing bodhicitta. Don't argue with me. I know I'm, I'm right. And I'm highly developed, actually. People don't realise. Really highly developed. And that's why I don't need to talk about it because it's obvious, isn't it? This kind of conceit can get built into our, our practice. And so we're pretending to be lowly, in other words, like the verse says, because we recognise we're meant to be lowly as spiritual practitioners, but it's actually become a new form of conceit. It's become, in fact, a mode of superior, superiority, which can be particularly pernicious, because it's creating the ideal conditions for the flourishing of hubris. We're maintaining our character flaws in a bed of ursus spirituality that's toxic in its effect. We're bathing in a sea of spirit, sentimentalised spirituality 
in order to preserve our self-cherishing, untouched by the troublesome exigencies of the everyday, including other people who actually have no bearing on my spiritual practice, which is so immaculately conceived that they're an impediment to my development. Sorry? Exigency. What does it mean? What was my context? <laughs> yeah, it just means whatever conditions arise that could be manipulated towards some particular outcome. I'm thinking, I'm arguing in a sort of provocative way that we can re falsely recenter self cherishing in the midst of our so called compassionate practice. It's, a form of well, it's not even that passive, is it? <laughs> no, but exactly. It can be very much so. Yeah. Oh, absolutely okay. So we're trying to be really honest here. Not, I'm not criticising anyone or criticising tradition. It's a tendency that we have to graft on defence structures for self-cherishing that can be dressed up in the plumage of advanced spirituality. <coughs> Yes, well. It's dressed up, non, the practice of non attachment dressed up in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a, raise, that's a very interesting point, but it raises a memory for me. When I was at school, I was very interested in Buddhism. I was going to a Christian school, so it wasn't easy. And um, my, I did religious studies as an HSC subject, and the teacher of that subject happened to be the school's priest used as an opportunity to uh, evangelise the superiority of Christianity over other religions. And so, anyway, it, it got back to this point, in fact. So I'm just... Uh, how do we put it? I've lost my, my way there, I think. Yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, but I mean, we love them. Uh, yeah, maybe 
Yeah, it depends how they are, but maybe you could do it yourself through the meditation or things that you're doing. You can't. Unless they help, unless they ask for help and they are ready to be helped, you can't help them. You can only love people. But there's a point though, it's not just always about being more superior and modesty. There's just um, some people, like, there's got to be boundaries there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that letting a bully or a person get away with it is enabling them as well. Yep. So these are all very, very vital topics. And I want us to keep some of these thoughts for our session after lunch, mm -hmm. which we've now arrived at lunch point. Um, Sering's very kindly cooked for us, but he, he's warned us to be on time because uh, he wants the food to be hot. So we're having a, an hour lunch to enjoy together and we can go strolling in the park and do other things as well uh, but to be back here at, at one o'clock